Hi, my name is Sarit Lesnik Kortsman. I'm married to Yonatan, Zohar's mother. This is about a year and a half now. And I'm currently pregnant, Baruch Hashem, in my fourth month. And I live on Kibbutz Alumim. Uh, usually, I haven't been living at home for the past about, it's been half a year now, I think. Um, I was born in America, in uh, Teaneck, New Jersey. Moved to Israel when I was three. Made Aliyah to Beit Shemesh and grew up in Beit Shemesh. Before the army, I joined a pre-army program. It's called the Year of Mechina. It's like the gap year. And we studied also religious studies and some philosophy. And we did some hiking and getting ready, getting prepared for the army. And um, that was a year that really kind of formed me as a person. It was a year that I kind of decided who I want to be. And I think that's what really pulled me back there after I finished my army service. Uh, I was in the army for four years. Um, when I finished my army service, I went back as a counselor um, to that mechina on Kibbutz Alumim, um, where I met my husband. Uh, we got married that year. And um, ever since then, I've been living on Kibbutz Alumim. So it was Chag, it was a holiday, and it was Shabbat, and it was at 6.30 in the morning where we hear a familiar sound, unfortunately, of a siren, and we, I ran to my daughter's room, she was uh, in her crib, we, we just moved her to her own room, it was like a whole process, uh, I jump up, grab her, bring her back into our room, which is the safe room, uh, and we close the door, and you know, we're kind of, like I said, used to it, so you just usually just wait in your room, 10 minutes, and then... Uh, and then you're free to continue on your day-to-day -day life, which is what we do. Like I said, it's something that we're not... Um, but this time it was different. The sirens just weren't stopping um, for about a half hour. Um, as religious Jews, we don't use our phones on Shabbat usually. Uh, but me and my husband looked at each other and we're like, okay, something is going on. Like these sirens aren't stopping. Something is weird. We have to... Uh, let, let's turn on a phone and see what's going on. And we have a WhatsApp group, a security group on the kibbutz. But the WhatsApp security group, um, they wrote uh, a major uh, a surprise attack. Stay in your house. Stay in your homes. Okay. So, so all we know is that there's a surprise attack, and that we have to stay in our homes. But it was it was something felt weird because usually there's like kind of I, I don't know I. I don't know how to explain it. I can say it, but it's not going to be clear. There's always some sort of tension before these rounds begin, mm -hmm. right? They call them these rounds mm -hmm. for the past 20 years where suddenly you just have some missiles coming, you go to your safe room and we continue. We understood this is very different. Um, and then we, we started opening the news to see what's going on on our phones. And that was when we saw the footage coming from Zderot, of terrorists in Zderot. That was, that was like... Um, I said, maybe, maybe it's like the soldiers doing a, a drill. Like my, my brain wasn't able to process that there are terrorists in Sderot. Mm -hmm. I studied in college in Sderot. I shop for my food in Sderot. I, it's my city, you know? Um, there's no way, like... Um, and then we get a message, um, terrorist on the kibbutz, stay in your room. Stay, stay in your safe room, lock your door, close the windows, and do not leave your safe room. So meaning not the, not the house. Don't leave your safe room until further notice. So that, we were never told anything like that before. Um, my husband's like, okay, wait a minute. He ran out, got a little yogurt for my daughter to eat something, got a bottle of water. Um, and then we were just uh, sitting there waiting trying to understand really what's, what's next. And it was just kind of a big shock. Um, at this point, we started getting phone calls and messages from friends all around the country, uh, including religious friends that usually don't, mm -hmm. wouldn't write to us on Shabbat. And then we started getting uh, notices about what's going on in Kfar Aza, what's going on in Be'eri. Um, and that was when my husband actually tried calling uh, our very good friend from Kfar Aza, who already at about... We lost contact with him at about eight, I think that was. Unfortunately, he was killed. Shachaf Berkstein, our very good friend. Um, he's originally from the kibbutz, and he moved to live. In, he lived in Kfaraza for a few years now, and that that was uh, like my husband the whole time. I already said like he's not answering. He always answers. 
Uh, he, we saw him the night before, on Friday night, before the Chag. He was in shul. They were all dancing. Um, you know, it was, it was the Chag. And um, it was actually the first time my husband said to him, he's like, Shachaf, why don't you sleep at us tonight? He has, his whole family lives on the kibbutz. Mm. Uh, but my husband offered him to sleep um, over at us. And it's kind of something that is stuck with him until today. Um, but that was like the first like red light. Was Shachaf isn't answering us. Like, he always answers his mm-hmm. phone. Um, and so I'm starting to get phone calls from, like I said, friends and family. Um, like suddenly I'm talking to my mom on the phone on Shabbat. It's like so, so weird. I said, oh, it's ruining my whole reputation of like uh, my, my, my cell phone bill. You know, <laughs> like suddenly I can't show them that I never use my phone <laughs> on Saturday. <laughs> um, but... Um, people are talking, saying, okay, are you guys okay? Are you guys okay? And just like, I just was really, um, I think with the whole tension, uh, we gave uh, my daughter just a, a box of crackers, <laughs> which became also a game and also food. <laughs> and it was really great. She was just, I say, I always say that part of our miracle was just how amazing my daughter was. She, it's, it's like weird to say that. Like, she was then only a year and two months, right? And now she's already a year and a half. Uh, and it's like a different person. Thank God she was young enough not to notice any of the sounds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I said, there are sounds that we're very used to. You know, the missiles. And, and e- even last time in Shomer Chomot, this was the round before, um, it was when Hamas had their new feature of um, suicide drones. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we were also told you have to stay in your safe room. And then we had to be in our safe room for a whole hour, which was like, wow, a whole hour. Mm-hmm. Um, now we're talking 26 hours with terrorists outside your window. Um, but we were, so that was something that was like new and that was like, oh, that's crazy, mm-hmm. right? But from between that and to having a terrorist running around outside your window, that wasn't, wasn't something, wasn't something I ever imagined, and I always, I always say that, even till this day, if you if you would tell me that what happened happened, I wouldn't believe you, because I felt so safe. I never felt that. Um, I mean, people have asked me that in the past, like, oh, you're not scared living in the Gaza envelope. You're not scared. You don't feel, uh, and no, I, I I felt safe. I walked around. Freely, my daughter walked around. She didn't walk. Now she's walking. But um, we were just very comfortable, and and now it never felt that um, somebody will physically come. And because you know the, the missiles were being shot, and we were in our safe room, and it was just kind of so, some kind of routine that we got used to. And I mean, it's a horrible routine, and it's not legitimate that to, to get used to something like that. Actually, just last week, um, I went down to the kibbutz again. I've been I've been there three times, uh, just to get you know clothing. <laughs> it's been winter. It's been summer, um, but um, I took my daughter for the first time, mm-hmm. who now, like I said, is a year and a half, and she walks. Mm-hmm. My husband is in uh, reserve duty now, mm-hmm. so I went with my mom, and we took her, and I was so nervous that she's not going to remember or, or recognize and she was just walking around on the leaves outside the house and in the really high grass that hasn't been cut for too long um, and and she really like she felt at home it was really fun to see her just like notice it like recognizing the place um, but what really shocked me was that there's it's very noisy still there's, there's a war going on three kilometers away, and um, at one point there was a very loud boom, Mm -hmm. Um, and so she looks up at me with like this, uh, like, like scared face, she had like a a scared, a scared, like a, she wasn't crying yet, right, she was like, (gasps) and she looks at me, and I say, it's okay, Zali can continue playing, it's fine, Mm -hmm. Um, so she comes over, she gives me a little hug on my leg, like, like, again, confused, like, question mark face. And then she goes back to playing. And that was, for me, like, something that was like, okay, like, if I always said that, you know, we have one baby and we can go back home, 
it was it was like a kind of a wake up call saying, you know what, she's not so young anymore and she really understands and she notices and and we kind of have to be patient and we can't go back right now when there's a war going on. Um, but that's definitely something that I totally fasted forward. So we have, uh, we're in the safe room getting these messages once every maybe a half hour, hour, it probably felt like a decade then, um, and phone calls from friends in the army, out of the army. Like I got a message from my friends, uh, my brother's friend, my older brother's friend, the person I haven't spoken to in probably, probably 10 years, something like that. And he sends me a message, are you an alumim? I said, yes. <laughs> and I know that he's a major in the army, that he's a very high up in a very special unit. And I told him yes, and I sent him my location right away without even thinking. Um, and that was when I started sending out my location. Um, people were messaging me and um, WhatsApping and calling, and I just started sending out my location to my, my sister-in-law's father's in the intelligence. Um, so he called me, and he's like, okay, just make sure that you have something blocking the door because they're, light, they're, they're lighting the, the safe rooms up. Um, make sure you have some water so you can maybe like put it at, and, and I was like, oh, I, I'm in a bedroom. I don't, I don't have all this. So I just like took like a pile of clothes and stuffed it um, onto, the, onto the door. My husband was actually physically holding the door for about six hours straight. Um, and like I said, my daughter this whole time is just sitting on the bed eating, eating the crackers and I'm just like looking at her getting crumbs all over my bed. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to have to change the sheets. I'm going to have to clean this room. And, then, and I was like, you know what? That's fine. Like I, I was like, in the beginning I was like dealing, like talking about it. Like, oh, like what a mess. How are we going to clean up? I'm going to have to vacuum all these. And then I'm like, you know, it's fine. Whatever. I don't care. I started sending out to my location. Um, and I sent it to my, to my sister thinking that, if, cause, cause we started getting the notices, obviously I said we were keeping up with the news, we're keeping up with the messages, uh, messages from the kibbutz and uh, we saw that people are getting kidnapped <laughs> and we know there are terrorists in the kibbutz and we know there's a war going on outside our house because we hear gunshots. You knew there were terrorists on your kibbutz? <clears throat> mm -hmm. We were told, um, we were told that to stay in the mm -hmm. safe room because there are terrorists on the kibbutz uh -huh. and, and we heard gunshots. Mm -hmm. Like, right. I, like, you know, that's not something mm -hmm. we're used to hearing right. um, gunshots outside our window. Mm -hmm. And we understand there's a battle going on right outside our house. And uh, I actually wrote to the head of security. Um, listen, like me and my husband, we both have been in the army. We both know how to use a gun. If there's any guns, like, we'll go. Like one of us. Like I, I told my husband, I don't care. If you don't want to go, I'm going. Like, <laughs> like there's a battle going on right here. Like we, we need we need it to help. Like, yeah. uh, and they said they have no guns left. Everybody's already fighting. And then we started getting notices that, um, that actually some people were injured. Uh, but I'm going to get back to that in a minute. So I, like I said, we were sending out our location and I sent my location to my sister and I told her, I said, listen, just, I have it on live location. It's good for eight hours. I'll just figure out a way to renew it. Um, but just so you have it, all right? So I really, you know, just, just did it as if like, here you go, like that's a, that's a, that's a convenient um, thing to have, just so you know where I am. And I said, I'm like, okay, I have like my baby. I'll just figure out, I'll hide the, the, the phone in her diaper or something, thinking that, you know, that would make a difference. Mm -hmm. We thought the baby might be safe. We thought that would have, uh, but we now know that that wouldn't have made a difference, unfortunately. One of the times when my husband ran out, um, actually I did, I, I do, I also do reserve duty um, in the paratroopers. And we, after a month of reserve duty, it was about a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, we got this like huge knife. <laughs> like this knife, I'm like, I don't know what I'll ever do with this knife. It's not a kitchen knife. <laughs> um, so I told my husband to get the knife. Uh, and actually when I was, went recently to visit the kibbutz, the knife is still next to the bed. Um, but it was just also, we were kind of trying, we were doing like a play by play. Okay, so, what, so the, if the terrorist comes in, we're gonna put the, like, we'll put Zohar, we'll put my daughter in the closet. I'll get the knife, you'll do that, we'll do that. And we were like staging it out, you know, just, and, 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 and it wasn't, it wasn't like full of stress. I didn't feel like I was stressed. 
Uh, it was just like being very, you know, like to the point. Okay, this is like we're in a situation. We have to deal with the situation. This is how we'll do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were just trying to really stay calm. We weren't talking so much. Like when you go back uh, and you remember really what it was, it was just both of us pretty much on our phones answering our friends and family mm-hmm. and um, and just trying to occupy my daughter, singing to her, playing with her, um, singing a lot of tehilim, mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of tefillot that we know by heart. Uh, but thank God, I, I, I don't remember like... Um, it being like a, like a, I don't know what to call it. Like it, didn't, it didn't feel like we were, it was like somehow we were able to like stay calm. And I think that it, I don't think it was just because our daughter, like our daughter was there. So we were, you know, just yeah, yeah, being like, okay, everything's under control. We're okay. Um, and honestly, I don't know how to explain it, but while we were stuck in the safe room, I, I didn't, I didn't feel like we were going to die. I just, I don't know, call it faith, call it hope, call it optimism, but I, I, don't, I don't know what it was. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that has stuck with me um, till this day, mm-hmm. but also hope, I'll get back to that at the end. Um, so that's what's going on in our house. What's going on outside is uh, we only figured out uh, a lot later on. We were in touch with our neighbors, like we live in a house that's so like we're attached to another, um, our neighbors, and actually our neighbor has a gun. He has a, a, a little gun and they have two young daughters and we were in touch with them the whole time because every time you open the safe room door, you hear a door opening, mm-hmm. like you hear it. So it was like, oh, it's us, we're going out. Okay, it's us, we're going back in. It's us, we're going out. Like, did you hear that? Yeah, I heard that. What is it? So we were on the phone with them the whole time. Mm-hmm. And at some point we were debating if maybe we'll go to their house or because they have a gun. I, and we just said, you know, like, I don't, I don't even feel safe enough leaving this room. So we're just going to stay here. My husband, like I said, he knows he has, he, he was in the army for six years. He knows how to use many guns. <laughs> and I think at this point, he just felt like I can't, like, th- this is the only way I can protect my family. And that was like, it wasn't even like a question. It wasn't even like tiring mm-hmm. for him at any point. For me, actually, at some point, I remember I got, I got a migraine. And so saying like, I didn't feel stressed, but my body knew that there was stress going on and I just got this crazy migraine headache. Um, so I find myself, like my husband holding the door, my daughter's like just crawling around and I'm like lying down and like, oh my God, Hashem, please, please help me. Cause what I was thinking is if I get kidnapped, I can't fight back right now because my head hurts. <laughs> like, how am I gonna protect my daughter? How am I gonna fight back? I can't, I have this migraine and I can't move. I was nursing then. <laughs> So I couldn't take like all the pills I would want to take. And thank God I was nursing because that's what I fed my daughter this whole time. And, uh, and my, I told my husband, you know, maybe I just need like a coffee, just some caffeine, something to help this headache. So he ran out, made me like a, a quick coffee. And thank God, I, that's also what I said. Like, this whole day was just full of tons of little miracles and, and <laughs> little miracles. I don't know what a little miracle is. But uh, thank God that really helped. And I, I got back to myself. I'm like, okay, I'm back. Like it, that was something that um, it just felt like I had control again, as much control as I can in this situation. Um, so like I said, uh, we ended up really being in the safe room. It was, it was 26 hours. At night, at about, I don't know if it was 12 o'clock, 2 a.m., something like that, the kibbutz told us, that in the morning we will be evacuated, probably to Tveria or somewhere else. Um, because of the situation, because of where we live and because of the rounds that we've experienced, they, had a, they have like an um, organized program of how to evacuate. Mm-hmm. And that we evacuate usually to hotels uh, and, and how it all works out. So it's something that was a little bit organized. It's kind of like, again, it's not something that hasn't happened before. So, you know, you pack up a bag and you go. But when you pack up the bag, you don't really know for how long you're packing up the bag. I don't think the, 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 the evacuations were never, um, they never like forced you to evacuate. Mm-hmm. Whoever wanted to take would stay. And this time it was very clear that everyone okay. is going to be evacuated. Um, and, and in the past, before my daughter was born, we didn't evacuate. Mm-hmm. The first time we evacuated was really 
when my daughter was born, when she was about, I don't, I guess it was, she was three months maybe, and there was a, some missiles coming in, and we evacuated. That was the first time. But other than that, I remember when I was a student, um, a lot of people evacuated. Me and my husband stayed. And I was, for 11 days, just between the couch watching the news and running to the safe room. And that was for 11 days. And that was when I actually started interviewing. <laughs> I was like CNN or something. I don't know. Like I just tried uh, spreading the word. So, like I said, it was at 8.30 in the morning. They said whoever wants to evacuate um, alone, they can. Uh, there will be a bus coming to take us to our next destination, <laughs> uh, which was unclear uh, exactly where that would be. So my husband's parents uh, came to pick us up with their car, mm -hmm. and we drove. Uh, we went to my parents in Beit Shemesh, and um, my husband's parents continued to his sisters who live um, in Gush Etzion. And that was at 8.30 8 in the morning. Um, leaving the kibbutz was a horror scene. I mean, it was a perfect setup for an action movie of how, uh, I mean, you know, it's the gate, our, our yellow gate, you know, it, it's... I mean, it's funny because if I would say yellow gate, nobody would understand, you know, the entrance of the kibbutz, the yellow gate. But now with all the footage that has been out, so everybody already knows, you know, that these kibbutzim have the yellow gates. And it's our yellow gate. And I go in and out of it a few times a day. And I, this is the road that I drive on many times. And it was, um, the left side was on fire. <laughs> uh, right by the gate, there was a body just there. Um... And on the right side of the road, there were just cars burning, shot at, upside down, um, doors open, glass shattered. Um, and then outside the miguniot, which are kind of like the safe rooms. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how you'd say that in English. Shelter? Yeah, the all, all these little shelters. Um, there was just tons of garbage and water bottles and um, I, I don't know thank God I don't know what to say but we we, we were there after uh, the shelters were already uh, raided and, and and cleaned out meaning there weren't still people in them along the road there's many many shelters and um, like I said outside every shelter there was like tons of stuff like also equipment and, and, like I said, bottles and bandages. Like we just saw on the side of the road, things flying like garbage everywhere. So this, this road that I'm used to is garbage and cars and, and glass. And it was just a, a scene, um, like I said, like a staged scene. It didn't, didn't look like my real life. She, we put her in the middle. She was in the car seat in the middle and my husband and I were sitting on the sides. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... I gave her a bag of bamba just to keep her occupied. Um, food always yep. keeps her occupied, mm -hmm. and she was she was just busy with that. Mm -hmm. Thank God. And and yeah, and that that was basically how we found ourselves leaving. What happened outside is um, is the the terrorists came in from the back gate of the kibbutz. And when they came in, they went straight to the to the industry area. So they kind of just like lit up the, the cow's food, which is in like a, the hay barn, um, lit up some of the chicken cubes, just, you know, killing, it, was, it ended up being 250,000 chickens. Um, and just like some of them burning them or causing damage to like the water and feeding system. Um, burning the brand new offices of the milk farm. And at some point they found we have, we have uh, foreign workers living on the kibbutz who help us out with agriculture and the milk farm and, and really help us out with the industry on the kibbutz. And they went into their little, they have like this little home and they went into their home and slaughtered them. Uh, 23 of them were killed, two were kidnapped. One has returned. Uh, one was, actually, was, was freed in one of the deals, and there's another one still kidnapped. And, and like I said, 23 of them uh, were foreign workers from Nepal and Thailand were killed. Um, 
And then that was when the emergency, emergency security team was called up because um, we have, thank God, the, the, we had people in the, in the war room, in the control room, who saw in the cameras the terrorists coming in. And so they were able to communicate with the, with the security team and actually like kind of navigate them mm-hmm. where the terrorists are coming in from. So in the beginning, like I said, they came in from one place, they came in from the back gate, and after they slaughtered the foreign workers, they were continuing on, um, they were continuing on to their mission. Um, in the footage, you actually see them um, coming in in motorcycles. They go from the back gate to the, sh- to the front gate. Uh, unfortunately, they met there a few um, of the, I'd call them, uh, a few of the, the, the people running away from the party, people that were able to run away from the party and got to the gate of the kibbutz. Mm-hmm. And they actually, some terrorists met them there, uh, unfortunately murdered them too, and just, you know, kind of went back to finish up with the foreign workers. At the same time, and like you can see really on the camera, on the footage, you have the, the security team of the kibbutz getting their guns, getting their gear on, going, getting ready to fight this battle. Um, and thank God, the emergency security team, which is built from ordinary men, these are our friends, their fathers, um, none of them work in security, none of them are in the military currently. Um, some of them do reserve duty, but not even all of them. Uh, and they just left their families in their safe room and went out to, to fight and save our lives. And they were successful. They really saved our lives. They fought alone until the army came for about, uh, it was about six hours or something like that. Uh, and like I said in the beginning, the, the terrorists really came in only from the back gate, but then later on they kept on coming in from, from two more, I think it was two more gates or even three more places. One was the, one they broke down a gate and the other was entrances that were um, gates. And uh, thank God, it was, it was just amazing how they were really able to, to go and, and, and fight and save us. Unfortunately, really three of the members, uh, three of my friends, three of the members of the security team were injured, um, but also not severely. There was an amazing story of a, we have a nurse on the kibbutz and she was able to really give them first care uh, and and then evacuate them heroically under fire, (laughs) which is, it's just, a crazy story, like just like if you're imagining it, the car driving with the trunk open, with somebody holding his gun, making sure that nobody is shooting, and getting shot at the car, I and mean, and they were really able to evacuate the 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 in the, the injured um, emergency security team people, and and save their lives. Really, um, they were able because the ambulances weren't coming in, ambulances weren't entering. The army was barely entering, so the, the only way to to save the, their life was really to, their lives was really to get them out. Mm-hmm. And so they went. That they ended up getting to the really. They had to drive. It was about a fifteen minute drive to Netivot to the next to where the the ambulances were standing waiting. Um, and that's how they were really able to save their lives and save our lives. I'm actually usually in the control room. That's also what I did in my military service. So when everything started, I wrote to them like, "Should I come?" And like, "You have a daughter." <laughs> Um, but I really wanted to be there you know everybody kind of felt like okay what can I do I I I I mean not everybody a lot of people just said okay I'm staying in my house and and they just they said everybody just stay in their homes okay we got this we're under control we have we do drills and I wasn't in the drill I was supposed to be I, I forgot where I was I mean life was normal but yeah I wasn't I wasn't in I remember seeing them uh, like running around the kibbutz with their helmets on and, and, and their guns and everything. And I was like, oh, good job, guys. Like, sorry, I can't participate. Mm-hmm. And, and I left. I, I, I don't know where I went. I think I some meeting or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so usually, so, so that's when I said, like, okay, like, so if I can't come to the control and then give my husband a gun, he'll come too. I mean, he was willing to do that. And yeah, that's, that was October 7th. And I think as time goes by, it just is. Ve- it 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 becomes very clear to me how how insane, like how unnormal and insane and and crazy really that day was. About six hours in, the army did come. A few army forces, different from different units, kept on coming in, and 
Um, unfortunately, a few soldiers were killed, saving our lives. <laughs> That's just something that is just crazy. Also, like when you think about it, you know that like this twenty run this this twenty one year old officer was killed protecting me, protecting my daughter, protecting my husband, protecting my home. And that's something that is very humbling. And, and it's just, I mean, thank God we're in touch with most of the families, like people from the kibbutz took it upon themselves. Um, and just to really show them like your, your sons saved our lives. And that's, that's really what happened here. And we're very grateful and, and, and hurting with them. Like these are our sons too now. They're part of our family because they sacrificed. So we don't know them, but we, we like I said, like we, we're, we've, we've contacted their families and we really want to, we want to get to know them because like we're family now. They gave the ultimate sacrifice, exactly. And, and that's something that we're trying to really keep, um, keep together. I think as the time goes by, the grieving space is is taken, meaning I, I don't have to give it space. Um, like I said, I'm in charge of the culture of the kibbutz, and uh, we were we had a really busy week that we did like a lot of projects. We had a, a tiyul on Friday, like a family picnic, and we had um, a family art project. It was it was during family week. A family art project and a family trip and a pic and a picnic and and so many things and I was so busy with phone and it was this one morning that I wake I woke up and um, because I was so busy like you sh unfortunately usually it's like you you wake up in the morning you open the news and you just hope not to see uh, anything and I was very busy that morning so I didn't even open up the news um, I took my daughter to to, to daycare and. Um, and I, th and I think at some point, like my husband who was, he was, he was home and he's like, I can't believe it. Like, it's horrible. It's horrible. Like, what's going on? And it was the day where 21 soldiers were killed. So like I open up my phone and I see this, uh, this article and, and how 21 soldiers were killed. And I just remember sitting down, um, like on the couch and just stopping and saying, you know, like. I'm trying so hard to continue and to and to move forward and and to keep busy and to try to make a routine and create here some kind of normal life Rebuild. um but like you can't continue now so I, I really remember just like sitting crying <laughs> um holding a cup of coffee and just sitting there and crying and saying like giving this moment um and again, I mean, I, it's not, I don't think it's healthy uh, mentally or physically, the, 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 that thought that I, and I keep on, I, I keep on pushing it away because I have this thought that these soldiers that are fighting in Gaza, it's, they're protecting me because, because of that, um, the situation where we are kind of separated from the rest of the country, like you said, like everyone kind of got used to it. You know, the, the battles is going on, the, the battles going on there and they're used to the sirens and they know they have their life routine with the sirens. So I guess something in that saying or in that feeling made me feel like not only was I in that battle, my home, but this war is going on to protect my home. And it's, and, 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 and it's obviously not true because that the terrorist would have loved to get to Tel Aviv and would have loved to get to Ashkelon and would have loved to get anywhere. So, so it's just something that like, when it comes up to my mind, it's like these soldiers are sacrificing their lives for me, for my home. Like, I don't, I don't want that. Um, I, I wish I can go home, but I don't want 500 soldiers getting killed for that. And then again, it just, it's this loop that it, it doesn't end. So I just will get up and make that phone call to, to make sure that we have a great program the next night. So on one hand, I feel like I'm able sometimes to just stop. And on the other, the other hand, um, I think the survival mode causes denial. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know if, if I'll ever say that it's, it's something that is, that I'm, I don't know how to, that, I don't know if, if, if I'll ever, I don't think I'll ever be um, like, I don't think I'll ever have a solution. Like, uh, it's a long process and I think that it, there will always be like a black spot there. Um, a, a pretty deep hole, and I think that's 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 something that has been caused from from this occasion, and and it will be there. And I think that that's something that I am prepared for, knowing that this occasion has changed my life forever. Mm-hmm. That's something that I have thought about a lot, and that I have um, that I have been very um, clear with myself about. Life won't be the same. Um, if that's if it's going to be what I'm going to do with my life, or it's how I'm going to raise my family, or where I'm going to raise my family, uh, but life won't be the same. So every night before my daughter goes to sleep, I say with her Shema and uh, Malach Goel. So we're singing to her that song, like because she kind of knows it. I mean, ever since she, the day she was born, every night I sing her Malach Goel. Um, so I was singing that with her, and then obviously just the Pirkei Telim that I remembered by heart, but. Uh, and all like the Shomer Israel, like all the songs that I just, uh, I don't know, I, I, really, I really felt like that's what's going on right now. I felt like that is, you say in Hebrew, emunat mima. And I feel like that is what, that is what I have, and what is what I had, pure, pure faith. And I think that those are also questions that I haven't, I haven't gotten to yet, um, because I mean, obviously, there's always the question of where's God and what. But I don't, I don't feel like I'm, I'm not at that point to ask these questions yet. Yeah. Like, like, like I mentioned, I think it's we're still survival mode, and maybe, maybe I'll get back to those questions, and maybe I won't. But that's not something that I'm dealing with right now. Um, it kind of reminds me of. Um, I forgot what it was. So one of my friends had like some issue with her mother-in-law or something. And I remember just like, she was talking to me and explaining and I was just like, now? Like, how you, like how can there be drama now? Like that, I just, I felt, I mean, she's my friend and I care for her and I, and I want to help her, but like I couldn't feel sympathy. I couldn't, I couldn't be there. Um, and that was just also something that it was, it was kind of, I understood, like, okay, we, like we have to categorize, you have to, the, to see what, what yes now and what maybe later mm-hmm. and, and what's more important and what's less important. Yep. Um, and that's something that has been going on ever since. Um, actually, I did want to mention my younger brother. Um, he's in the army. He's a paratrooper. Mm-hmm. And on October 7th, he also contacted <sighs> us. He was, um, he was on a regular... Uh, in his regular Shabbos and in, in his base when everything began and he actually um, they they were called up and he said I'm coming I'm coming to Halloween I know where you live and we're coming to rescue you because I understand that it's crazy so I spoke to that as secure and I told him listen my brother has a jeep with five guys um, they want to come he's like okay so th- like tell them they should call me but like be careful you know because the chaos was insane and everyone uh, was very unclear. So people, many people were, were getting also injured from friendly fire mm-hmm. because you don't know who's a terrorist, who's a soldier. So, so I told him, I'm like, you know what, don't, don't come. Like, if you want to come, call this number. Maybe like your commander could contact him and maybe you guys could come. So they went to Sderot, uh in their Jeep. They were called in to like, uh, they said they had, there was some situation going on in the train station. So they went there and there ended up being nothing there. And when they got out of the train station, they saw that their car, somebody mixed up their cars. So their car was there and this, somebody took their car and they had to change cars. And they called up the guy and said, where are you? I'm in Kfar Aza, come. Um, and that's basically how that day ended because he ended up in their car. Just they went to swap cars in Kfar Aza and he ended up staying there and fighting um, the battle in Kfar Aza for about three days, he was there. Uh, and he was alone, he wasn't with his whole unit, he wasn't with his whole team. Uh, it was him, another two commanders, and he was there. And then 
right after that, he they went to base, they did some training, and once they went into Aza, he was there. Um, so it's been five months today, and he has been out. He, he was out twice, and actually the third time he got out, they gave him a, a, a week off. So it was like finally kind of to see him again. Um, every time he got out, he got out for two days. Um, and slowly, slowly, he's sharing his experiences and the, the amount of miracles that had happened to him. Um, not once and not twice has he had a grenade in between his legs that just didn't blow up, that he's been shot at, that things have exploded, that he, his friends went out on a mission, that his commander told him, you know what, you look tired, stay here. And they had a missile fall and, and his friends were killed and injured. Um, and now actually his unit, he might not be going back because they started off uh, with 13 and now they're eight. Um, some were killed, some were injured, um, some finished their army service already. So he said like, our team is missing, you know? So it's, it's kind of hard to fight like that. Uh, so on one hand, he feels as if, um, you know what, I did a lot. But on the other hand, um, he says, like, it's not over yet. Like, how can I go home when there are still people that are hostages? And, and I know how horrible it is because I'm there. I was there. So I could just imagine how horrible the, 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 the what a horror these, these hostages are, 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 are dealing with. Um, and, and he said, and you can't go home. Like he said to me, you can't go home. So how can I be home? Um, so that's just my amazing little brother. He was supposed to end his army service uh, in March. He was supposed to finish three years. So he might, like, like I said, maybe have like a little break and then go back. But it's not, not very clear right now. My brother-in-law, who is also in the special forces, um, also a few months ago during a mission in Aza was injured severely. I got a phone call. I, I, my phone is usually, um, I put it on vibrate at night, so I hear it, especially during the war. Um, but this time, it was four o'clock in the morning. I physically got out of my bed. I was standing next to the desk just to go look at my daughter a second, and she, she wasn't even crying. It's not like uh, something happened, but I just stood up, and I suddenly saw my phone, like the light turn on, and my sister was calling. So I right away answered my phone at four o'clock in the morning and she said, listen, um, my husband just called and he, he said he's injured. I'm on the way to the hospital. She was calm. So I was calm. I'm like, okay, like, what do you, uh, like, do you know what's going on? He's like, no, I spoke to him. She said, he spoke to me. So I said, that's a good sign. He spoke to you. That's a good sign. Um, and he, he was injured severely in his legs and uh, his stomach. He's been through, it's 13 surgeries now. He's still in a, in a, in a wheelchair. Uh, my husband, my my um, my parents are renovating now uh, their basement to make sure he has an access accessible bathroom. Um, his parents are renovating; they moved out of their apartment they lived in. And my sister has been in the hospital for the past few months. She hasn't left him for a minute. Um, they have children? They don't have children. They just got they got married two years ago. Um, but that's. That's also something that, as a family, it's 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 something that you're dealing with, um, that you're nervous about. Because, like I said, thank God he's he's okay. Mm -hmm. But the orthopedic complications um, and random fever going up because of all these different kinds of viruses and infections and 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 it's not it's not easy. It's not easy. Thank God he's amazing and he has such strength, mental strength and physical strength and, and emotional strength. And he's just, him and my sister together, just so optimistic. And, and I think that just like looking at them, having that faith gives us, you know, um, gives us faith and, and gives us air to breathe, you know? So we're not like what's going on at all times because they keep themselves occupied and, and, and he's obsessed with doing his... Um, physical therapy and, 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 and it's, it's, it's just really great um, to see. That's something that I think is, uh, it's, it's something traditional. 
the faith mm -hmm. and the belief. I think it's something traditional, like, like I've said in the past, the Jewish nation has always been run that, like we're, we're always chased, mm -hmm. right? And that's something that I think it's, it's somehow in our DNA just to continue. Um, and for me, every time I went to visit the kibbutz and I saw, like I said, the really high grass and the leaves, like it's usually the kibbutz is like gorgeous and everything is always perfect and, and the gardening especially. And seeing that was just like, you know, it, it was like a pinch, but it gave me, mo it's like, I have to come back. This is where we're going to live. This is where I'm going to raise my children. And, and this is where we're going to rebuild and grow and, and be stronger. Because I think that's something as a nation that we do. We never, we never give up. We get hit hard and it hurts and we grieve. But we know we have that strength. I think, I think it's something about how we know how to unite. And everybody together just can, can gather and, and continue forward. And for me, that's, it seems that I, I don't see a different option. I don't think, I think that if I'm just standing in my spot, then I can fall backwards or sink. So we just have to move forward. And I think that's for me personally, um, for my family, for the kibbutz and for the Jewish nation. At no point, even while being evacuated, even while sitting in the car, waiting to leave, being escorted by army jeeps. At no point was I told there are no terrorists mm -hmm. because it wasn't, true. it wasn't true. Because there were still terrorists in Kfar Aza fighting and there were still terrorists further down mm -hmm. south. Yeah, yeah. At, at no point was it very clear that, it, that it's safe, All right? And I think some people feel till this day that it's still not safe. Kibbutzim are very different than cities, um, than, than, than any way anybody lives in the world. Very, very communal, very, very, and everything, every decision and every move has to be voted on mm -hmm. and everyone together decides. And now, uh, what's happening now, we've been evacuated to Netanya, mm -hmm. uh, kind of have been trying to create some kind of routine. So we have uh, elementary school we built, I'm an English teacher. I have a teacher certificate for teaching radio in high school. And I'm teaching second and third graders English now. We have programs for the elderly. We have um, programs for the kids, programs for the women. I, like we really have some sort of routine here. We're evacuated to two hotels here in Netanya. And we've created some kind of uh, like I said, routine. And we have once in a while, like community meetings, trying to understand what people are feeling. Mm -hmm. So some people, uh, mostly a few older couples that don't have kids, um, who work in the South, said, I, I have to go back to work. Mm -hmm. So they really, um, they, there are a few people that just now, this, just this week went home. Mm -hmm. So there are about six couples living on the kibbutz now. Mm -hmm. mostly, uh, mostly older couples living there. Um, and there are discussions. Uh, I think it's, it's become, because there are a lot of decisions uh, being made by the, by the country and, and um, about like giving permission to go back. A lot of people in Stillwater are going back, you know, like people in the South, they're, they, they're, they're saying it's safe to go back. Mm -hmm. But the families with kids that, uh, the, a couple that their 13 year old, 11 year old and nine year old are sleeping in their beds with them mm -hmm. since October 7th, or the family that their 11 year old has to sleep with diapers again, or the family that, their three-year-old doesn't walk alone, not even to the bathroom. So these families aren't ready to go back mm -hmm. because it's enough that one siren will go off and these kids 
Yeah. They won't. They won't function. And it's enough that they'll hear that one l- loud boom or, or hear the gunshots coming from Gaza again and, and we hear it. It's not that you don't. There's a war going on three kilometers away, four kilometers away, and you hear it. And that's not a place where a lot of families want to bring their kids. And some do and some don't. And it's causing a lot of tension and, 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 and a lot of nerves within the kibbutz, within the community. Um, so that's something that actually we're dealing with right now. Because mm-hmm. um, there's an option to go back now. And we've been told that um, it's going to be July 7th. That's the date. And then some people are saying, like, how can you just say, like, who? July 7th, you know? What if the battle's continuing? What if the war is not over? Mm-hmm. And if the war is not over, then who, where am I going on July 7th, because it's not going to be home. Personally, like I said, like it was very clear to me that I'm going once I can, once I have a daycare for my daughter, because I'm not going to take her away from all her friends and, and just have her with me all day. That's not healthy for any of us. Mm-hmm. Um, especially my daughter, she's very social. Like, <laughs> um, So I said, like, I'll go back once we have education. But they just said, like, okay, what if we do that before Pesach? Before, in the beginning of May. What if we do it at the end of May? Like, but, you know, you can't just, like, throw out these dates. Like, what if the war's not over? Like, let's, let's talk about it like that. There's, like, good Jews, many, 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 many opinions, right? There's, like, one situation, a thousand opinions, and that's, thank God, very accurate to us. Uh, to the community, to the kibbutz. So that's something that's very open. It's not very clear when we're going home. But I think what is clear for most of the kibbutz, not everyone, but a lot of families and for me personally, it's clear that we're going home. Mm-hmm. I'm, we're going we're gonna to live there. That's where our future is. And we're going to rebuild and, and renew and, and, and grow there uh and we have patience to to do that when the time is right um i mean we'd love to do it as soon as possible but if we have to wait we will and that's what we've been doing and and we'll continue our kibbutz is is one of the kibbutz team that had the most industrial harm our homes are there right so that's another reason why we're being uh, a little bit more forced to go home. It's like, you have a home, go. But the industry was damaged. We have, like I said, the milk farm is a very big income and the chicken cubes is a very big income. And we have a vegetable packaging um, factory, which was also injured. The, 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 the terrorists came, invaded that um, factory and basically kind of tried taking over the factory and built there some kind of, um, what they did is, is it, it's, it's a high, um, it's a very high factory. And what they did is kind of go up to the higher areas and use the factory uh, in order to attack the main road. Because mm-hmm. it's, it's on the main road and they were able to basically uh, really cause a lot of harm to any cars on the main road from the factory. Mm-hmm. So the factory itself, once we, uh, once the, the army and, and, and the emergency security team were trying to intercept these terrorists, they, um, they, had, they, they had a battle in that, in that factory and there was a lot of harm caused there too. Mm-hmm. The factory has, thank God, gone back to work. Many of the factories in the kibbutz are back at work. Um, in the milk farm, actually, some of the survivors, some of our foreign workers that survived are back working in the milk farm, meaning after October 7th, they flew back to Thailand to their families and some of them came back to work, which is crazy. It's really amazing. Um, and you speak to them, it's like crazy to see these, uh, I mean, these amazing people from Thailand who really just came here to earn uh, income. They just, they really felt connected. They're like, no, like, we're here and we trust the army. And, and it's just like hearing these people, it's amazing. It's really amazing, unlike what we hear from all around the world. And I think that's something that, for me, was a really interesting message, you know, how these people live here. They live on the kibbutz with us. We work with them every single day. And they feel safe here. And they like us. Mm-hmm. And they appreciate us. Mm-hmm. They've chosen to come back 
and work in this area, which is very unsafe. Yet in New York, in London, in San Francisco, and everywhere, um, you have these crazy riots against us, you know, from these college students who, who don't even know what's the river and what's the sea, right? And, and that's just, for me, was a message like, you know, I guess there's something, we must be doing something right if the people who actually know enjoy and, and appreciate and stay. Uh, and I think that was a really interesting message for me. Also for the kibbutz as a community, I think that that shows something, that they came back. I, um, but I think also, I, as, like, personally, for me personally, it seemed like, you know what, if, if, if you let someone in, genuinely, and, and honestly, like, you show your real face, then that, that's the most clear way to get the message out. And I think that's something that, I guess that's why I'm here today. <laughs> and I guess that's why uh, I really try, you know, to, to speak whenever I can and, and, and get the word out there because I just think that's, that's what we have left to do. I mean, I appreciate all of the fellow Jews abroad all of our, my, my brothers and sisters abroad who are fighting this crazy anti-Semitism going around. Um, and I send them so much strength and, and, and just like tell them like, we appreciate you guys so much and, and thank you guys for your amazing work because that's another war going on. That's a, that's a world war going on. I mean, the war here is pretty complicated too. But uh, you cannot, I feel like we cannot underestimate um, that war, too. And I'm very grateful for everything that everyone is doing in order to fight that battle. My husband was, um, we were both called up while in the safe room. Like I said, we both do reserve duty. Um, and we were both called up while in the safe room. Um, like I said, I'm a... a controller officer and he is a commander and um, we obviously weren't able to get to the location we were supposed to actually my unit was in a battle in Kfar Aza and his unit um, entered the battle in Aza later on in Gaza later on and we after we evacuated by the time he got back to his unit somebody else has taken his place Somebody that was supposed to. They were getting, you know, for a few, in, in reserve duty, things are a little different. And so this person knew that he was, he was going to uh, take over his job and my husband's going to move on to a different job. So he got a different job um, during that period, um, during that transition, I'll call it, um, of his jobs. Uh, we were notified that his friend, they found uh, Shachaf's body. Um, before that, he was just missing. Mm -hmm. um, so then my husband, he was out of the army and he was uh, home for the funeral and for the shiva. Um, and then um, it was very, it, this is his best friend from the kibbutz from birth. They've really been together since birth. Um, so he was having a, a hard time. And his commander said, listen, I feel like you have to be home now. You've been through a lot. And, and so he was, his commander really sent him home. He's like, no, I want to stay. I want, no. His commander sent him home. Um, he was home for about, like I said, it was about a week of Shiva. And he's like, I have to, I have to do something. And then he joined the emergency security team on the kibbutz. Um, and then it was basically, he was like a week on the kibbutz and a week home. A week on the kibbutz, a week home. Uh, it was kind of on and off like that. Um, when his unit got called up to go fight in Gaza, he said, like, this is a war going on in my backyard for my home. I'm going. And he did. So he, that's where he went back to join his unit in the south after about a month. I guess he was there, uh, maybe even less than a month. They were, they were let out of uh, reserve duty. Um, and they said, you're going to get called back. Uh, we're going to go do some more routine guarding in the north, up north, in the, in the north of the country. Uh, so he's been 
right? So he's been there now for about, it's already two weeks. He has another like almost a month left um, that he's up north and they're also um, guarding the borders there. And it's, I mean, I don't know how many people know really what's going on up north, but uh, it's, it's, there's a war up north too. He's very busy. <laughs> I speak to him like, <laughs> I would try to speak to him, but every time it's like, hey, who are you? Good, oh, one second, um, call you back. <laughs> hey, how are you? Oh, it's, yeah, I'm great. Oh, yeah, how are you doing? How's Zoal? Oh, can I see Zoal? Video call. One second, I'm calling you on video. Oh, wait a second, once I have to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that's what he has to do now. That's his job now, and I, I understand. Honestly, for me, it's been, um, my unit was also already let out. They were there for, they were in Gaza for, uh, I think it was maybe 50 days straight, something like that. Um, and it was really difficult for me not to be there because I did reserve duty when I was pregnant and I did reserve duty while I was nursing and I did reserve duty um, for, for, for a month after I got out of my regular army service, I went back to reserve duty. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was very hard for me not to be with my unit. And you weren't with them because of the pregnancy? Or because, because of Zohar. Of Zohar. Um, so I felt as if me being alone with Zohar and dealing with everything kind of alone was kind of my way to, to, to take part um, in the battle. And, and that's, that's something that has helped me uh, during, you know, the challenging times of, of being a single mom and, and being evacuated <laughs> at the same time. Um, but uh, I guess the low points are really the, the, so, like the soldiers being killed or just the thought of the hostages like I said, Shachaf, a friend, he didn't live on Alumim, but he worked on Alumim. Um, in Alumim, we have a dining room. So you have lunch every day in the dining room. And I was actually, uh, after I gave birth to Zohar, um, I, started, I was actually working from home. And I would go, uh, we could say go up, because <laughs> you walk to the dining room. And I'd go up to eat lunch every day uh, with Shachaf, because he worked on the kibbutz, so he came to eat lunch. And I would... Uh, so it's like very so so that's something that I'm kind of dreading, um, just that thought of going up to eat in the dining room and him not being there. I haven't experienced it yet, um, but that's like a thought that I know that I know is gonna be is gonna be difficult. That's that's gonna be a moment that I'll be like, he's 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 gone, yeah. Um, and also seeing my husband, you know how much he really misses him. Like, it was really like his brother. <laughs> it's okay. I didn't, you know, I actually, I always, told, I always told my husband, like, I feel like I didn't give Shachaf enough, like, respect, you know? Like, I didn't... Um, Meaning grief? Or? Yeah. Mm-hmm. His funeral was horrifying. It was pouring. Mm-hmm. It was just, it was really bad. Like, um, my husband uh, insisted to hold, um, you know, when you... Costco. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and to really walk to the grave. Um, and it was pouring. It was, it was horrible. Uh, so I couldn't even hear anything, um, get alone to see anything. And then I'm just like standing there and just staring, like everyone's just getting drenched. Like, um, and, and I always tell him, like, I feel, I feel like I didn't give him mm-hmm. the respect that, that, that he deserves. I mean, he wouldn't want anything. It's like, Shachaf is very like, just, you know, love the simple life. Um, he worked in a program called Shvir Israel. It's the um, it's basically a, a hiking trail that goes through the whole entire country, 
and he was like in charge of the logistics. And Tzvi Israel, it's it's a, a family from the kibbutz that they lost their son in um, a son of Mesokim in 1997. Their son was killed in a helicopter um, accident, in the helicopter accident. And in his memory, they've created um, this Shvi Israel where you have like a whole logistics and a whole group, and, and it's really, really amazing. And Shachaf worked there for a while. Um, he did, I think, a few times. So they were very connected to him, and they decided that they want to do um, part of the trail is, is for his memory. Um, so as the head of culture, they, uh, they contacted me and asked if, if we're interested as a kibbutz to join, to join them for that part of the trail in Shachaf's memory. Um, so hopefully that's something we'll be doing um, pretty soon, like the whole kibbutz walking together, hiking uh, this trail in Shachaf's memory, which is, is, is really something I think is really special and, and, and maybe giving him a tiny bit of, of that respect that he, that he deserves and, and, and maybe something he would like appreciate, you know, like he wouldn't appreciate uh, I don't know, like to put up like a park or something, you know, a monument, no, like, no. Just the walking, um, a little bit sweating, being outside, like that's what he would appreciate. So that's something I'm, I'm very grateful for, like as the head of culture that, that I have the opportunity to, to really uh, take a part um, in something for his memory. Um, so yeah, so, so I think one of the downs is really losing a friend. While my brother was there, uh, hearing losses from his unit, he's in the paratroopers, uh, 202, um, and just hearing every time like a paratrooper was in there, like the, the, my heart would just, um, and actually seeing my parents knowing how my parents think that they actually have an apartment nearby uh, in Netanya, so I, 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 I stay at them. And how they're trying to be so strong all the time. Um, and knowing how hard it was for them, like having me evacuated, having my brother fighting the battle in Gaza, having my sister stuck in the hospital, um, uh, stuck sounds negative. Not stuck in the, ha the hospital. Having my sister staying with her husband in the hospital, um, and they're just really staying so strong. And I admire them and and appreciate them so much. And I think um, I think that's something that is just uh, these times where where you you. you you appreciate everything that that you have, um, and I, I find myself really, really appreciating um, my family now, my friends, and everything. Um, and I think that's something that I guess I can say as a high point. Um, like it was just now when I took Zoel to the kibbutz and watching my daughter walk around the kibbutz for the first time because she never walked there. Mm -hmm. She only crawled. Mm -hmm. She started walking here in Netanya and seeing her walking um, on the roads of the kibbutz, um, opening up the cabinets at home, really feeling at home. Like she didn't forget our home. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was something that also was just like, like this is our home. Um, and actually after this time was when I was, when I was there, I got, I got back to Natanya and I said, I said to my mom, I said, like, I think, I, I think I know what homesick means. Like, I'm really homesick. I really want to go home. Um, and, uh, that, that seeing Zog remembers our home and seeing her act as if she's been there the whole time and just being in her natural habitat um, was something that for me was really exciting. Like I was very nervous mm -hmm. and it was very exciting to see her like that. I've, I've been uh, contacted a lot um, from people all over the world who, who really just, you know, what can we do? How can we, how can we help? Um, and I think, um, other than, 
us um, sharing our stories, uh, having other people really share the stories is something, like you said, is really important and, and getting to know, just learning from the people who, who, who sacrifice their lives is important. And, and taking the, their strength because there's so much strength in these people, these soldiers, these young men um, and young women who just left everything and are really taking part in, in a war for the Jewish nation. Like it's, it's so historical. I, I, I spoke to my brother about it when he just got out. I said like, like one day, I told him, one day you'll understand what a huge part of history you are. Um, and that really um, connects myself to something that I, I, uh, I felt. My, my grandfather passed away. Um, it must be three months now. Um, and my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. And um, I remember um, when somebody contacted me really to say, like, we wanna, um, we wanna video you so, so, we can, so, we, so we can tell your story, so we can share your story. We want, and at that point I was like, is, is it like, like I forced my grandfather to go to Yad Vashem to tell his story. Um, like, am I going to go around schools telling my story um, like I brought my grandfather? And, and that's something that for me is just like, it's a crazy thought that like history is repeating himself, is repeating itself. Um, and it's kind of like a, a, a test of like how you know, how, how we've done it in the past. And I'm not going back to the Bible. It's how we've done it in the past in, 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 in 67. We built a state. So I'm waiting to see what state we're gonna build now. Um, we have the state, so now we could just make it better. And I think that's something that we'll all do, all doing and continue doing together. And I just hope, um, we don't forget because sometimes, sometimes it's easy to, to, to just get into some kind of routine and, and forget what has happened. And I think that in order not to forget, we have to share the stories and, and mention them. I mean, we don't have to grieve all day. That's not, that's not something healthy for anybody. That's not what I think Judaism is about. Um, but definitely remember and share and, and fight the, the battles we need to fight. Like I said, anti-Semitism and people that are saying that things like these didn't happen and, 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 and just make sure that it's this, this occasion isn't forgotten and that the real face of Hamas is revealed and people understand who the real bad guy is um, and that we end this when this ends, we'll be stronger, better, and united. Bezal Tashem.